Good morning. Welcome to Cornerstone Cowboy Church this morning. Before we get started, I'd like to welcome brother and sister Roe this morning. This is their first Sunday service. Right now, brother, come over here. Let's go ahead and pray together. Father God, we thank you for this couple that is coming here. Father, we pray for your guidance, your leading. Father, we pray for the anointing of the Holy Ghost to be on them, Father. Father, we pray that bring us through this time that we're in right now, Father. Father, times that we go through right now will make us stronger, Father. Father, we just ask God the blessings upon the service. We ask in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Brother? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing. <laughs> I messed it up. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus sing his mercy and this is still bad let me start that over song and everything sing the wondrous love of Jesus sing his mercy The mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place when we all get to heaven. What a day of rejoicing that will be when we all get to Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathways, clouds will overspread the sky. Would the traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just a glimpse of Him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open and we'll walk the streets of gold. When we all see Jesus. Shout the victory. Everybody will be happy, will be happy over there. We will shout and sing God's praise. Everybody will be happy over there. Oh, everybody will be happy, will be happy over there. We will shout and sing God's praise. Everybody will be happy over there. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. God is so good, isn't he? 
You know, I'm so excited uh, to be here. My name's Kevin Rowe, and uh, I'm excited to be here at the church this morning. Um, I just want to thank everybody at the church for believing in us, and uh, I, I really wanted this first service to be filled full of filled full of people here at the church, but, uh, you know, our times have changed that, and, and we're having to do things a lot different, but... Uh, I want to thank the church for adopting us, bringing us into the church, uh, making us family. Um, we have some people, we've got a prayer list of uh, some people who need our prayer. We want to come to you now. We want to open up the service with prayer. So if you would, please, um, while you're sitting out there, just <clears throat> get into the presence of the Lord. Let the Lord come be a part of us here. Lord, we come to you right now. Lord, we thank you for technology that allows us to come together. In your presence, where two or more gather in your name, it says that Jesus is there. Lord, we come to you right now thanking you for technology that allows us over, over live stream to reach so many people right now today. Lord, we just ask for you to... Uh, be with Bridget's sister, Faith. We ask for Ben Flocking with the ALS. We ask that you heal them in the name of Jesus Christ. John Luke, he's two year old with cancer. We ask that you heal him in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, we plead the, we plead the blood over these. That you allow them to be healed, Lord. It says we're two or more gathered in his name. Whatever they ask in his name, it shall be done, Lord. Lord, we come to you in strengths of hundreds asking you right now to heal these people, Lord. Lord, thank you for the good report that we have from Brother Kenny. He's strengthening every day. Lord, we ask for the healing on Sister Rice. In Jesus' name. Lord, we ask that Brother Keno, he's having problems with his neck. Lord, you know what it is. Lord, we ask that you put your hands on him, that you speak it into existence. You're the father of all. You're the master. You're the great I am. You spoke and time stood still. Lord, you, you commanded the water to part and people walked across on dry land. There is nothing too big or too small for you, Lord. Lord, we have Michael Davy has shingles, health issues. We ask that you, uh, that you be with them. That you put your healing hands on them. In the name of Jesus. Lord, Holly is stage two pancreatic cancer. Lord, we just, that's not of you, Lord. We ask that anything that is not of you be taken out of her body in the name of Jesus. Let her go in and not say she's there for her appointment. Let her go in and say, I'm here for my testimony. I want it in writing. Lord, we ask that Curtis, his arm in the dialysis tube, that, that Lord, that you, you know what he needs, Lord. We just ask that you... Uh, Bless him and that you, that you allow your presence and greatness to come over that. Fix that situation. Last, we ask that uh, the mother of Brother Carl, she needs your prayers. And Cassie has one kidney and the kidney stones are trying to... Uh, cause problems, Lord. We ask right now in the name of Jesus that you just make that disappear. To give her comfort and peace, strength. There's Rosemary. Prayer for her needs, Lord. You know what they are. Lord, we ask for the hernia operation on Linda to be successful and for her healing to be so, so fast and so well that the doctors are am amazed of how quick that the healing 
that's taking place. Jeanette, Jeanette would just ask that her knee operation for healing on it, Lord. Let that work the way that you designed it to be, Lord. She has no more problems or issues with it. She gets healed up and can move around, be mobile so fast, Lord. And Kelly has a cyst, Lord, that we ask that that just be removed right now in the name of Jesus. No problems, no issues with that, Lord. Rocky has a broken hand, Lord. I just ask that you, that you heal that and that you give him peace and, and comfort and that you remove the pain. Lord, you know what it needs. You can do all things, Lord. Felix is in rehab, Lord, and we ask right now that you just let whatever he's going through, Lord, that it start working miraculously. The doctors are amazed by it, Lord. These are testimonies for you, Lord. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Christina has TMJ, Lord. We ask that you just remove that in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you so much that allows us to come together like this, Lord. Lord, we're going to ask something extra special today, Lord. Everybody's supposed to be trapped in their house and worshiping here, and we just thank everybody for coming, for you putting it on their heart to get up this morning and join us. And Lord, we want to thank you right now that we got word today that we're going to be able to have Easter service out here in the parking lot. We're going to have a drive-up church service. Have everybody start telling all their friends and everybody that they can come up here and be a part of this, that we can meet on Easter morning, that we can come together and assemble in the name of Jesus for your glory, Lord. For your glory, we owe everything. We thank you for everything that you do for us. We ask you to watch over us and take care of us. And be with us through this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Let the rain of your presence fall on me. Every day that I live. With every breath I breathe, let the rain of your presence fall on me. Everywhere that I go, would let your presence show, rain on me. Love divine, joy unspeakable. Overflowing in my soul, this heart of mine is refreshed and at rest in your presence, in your presence, in your presence. Praise God. Praise God. He is so good. Absolutely. Absolutely. God is good, is he not? Yes, he is. He is so good. He takes care of us in all situations. We just come to you right now asking for your presence to be with us, Lord. Thank you for everything. Thank you for everything. When I was just a little man, 
all stood up for Uncle Sam. Put our right hand upon our heart. And in prayer is thou and thee the star. Well, pride ran rampant through the lane. We were proud of who we were back then. In America. Well, my great great Paul fought in the war. And great colored was his uniform. Well, the brother Billy wore the blue. I can't imagine what they both went through. Well, both shed blood for liberty. And that's what this country means to me. In America. Come on, y'all, let's take a stand. Let's put God back in the major plane. Well, let's hear the bell of freedom ring. And let's light the torch of liberty. Well, let's pledge allegiance just once more. And then watch the mighty eagle soar in America. Well, my grandpa fought the Second War, and he talks of how he hit the shore. Well, the water was pink, the sand was red, and all I God could have took him where he lay, but I would not be here today in America. And he said that it was up to me to keep alive the memory. All of those who died that way And the reason why, oh, glory waits And the price it costs to keep men free And that's what this country means to me It's America, amen Come on, y'all, let's take a stand. Let's put God back in the major plane. Well, let's hear the bell of freedom ring. And let's light the torch of liberty. Well, let's pledge allegiance just once more. And then watch the mighty eagle soar. In America, God bless America. You know, we live in a country that may not be as good as we want it to be, but it's still the best country in the whole world. Thank you, God. God bless the USA. Amen. Yeah, man, I'll tell you what a good God we have. He takes care of us in all situations. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And of course, you know, you can always have trouble with your communications and stuff like that. But our God is bigger than that, isn't he? Amen. He is bigger than that. I want to take this time right now to... To thank everybody out there that's listening, that's tuned in. And what I want to ask y'all to do is, during this time when you're stuck at your house and we're coming to praise the Lord, I want you to do something. I want you to start getting up 
getting your clothes on, getting dressed like you're coming to church. Because, you know, it's so important that we take this as a time not just for something to do, but that we honor God in what we do. How important it is that we show him how important he is to us. And I know you're at home and you're probably sitting on the couch, but get your Bible out, grab your Bible, get your clothes on, and let's praise the Lord together, just like we were right here in this room together. When he said that you're not good enough, when he said that you're not right, when he said that you're not strong enough to put up a good fight, when he said that you're not worth it, when he said that you're not loved, when he said that you're not beautiful, you would never be enough. Well, fear is a liar. Well, it'll take your breath, stop you in your steps. Cause fear is a liar. Well, it'll rob your breath, steal your happiness, cast your fear to the fire. Cause fear is liar. When he told you you were trouble, you'd forever be alone. When he said that you should run away, you will never have a home. When he said that you were dirty, you should be ashamed. When he told you you could be the one that grace could never change. Well, fear is a liar. Well, it'll take your breath, stop you in your steps. Cause fear is a liar Well, it'll rob your rest Steal your happiness Cast your fears To the fire Cause fear is a liar Let your fire bomb cast out all my fears. Let your fire bomb, cause your love is all I feel. Let your fire bomb cast out all my fears. Let your fire bomb, cause your love is all I feel. And fear is a lie. It'll take your breath, stop you in your steps. Cause fear is a liar. Well, it'll rob your rest, steal your happiness, cast your fears to the fire. Cause fear is a liar. his name. Praise his name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Okay. Everybody out there, uh, get your Bibles out. Get your Bibles out. I got to get my Bible. Yes, absolutely. You know, isn't that song right? 
You know, fear is a liar. You know, uh, right now there's a lot of stuff going on. There's a lot of craziness in this world. There's a lot of people right now who's, uh, who's scared to death. They are. They've let fear overtake their life. They're locked in their house. A lot of people's not working. They uh, got fearful and went out and bought all the toilet paper in the world. Bought up everything that they could. Bought up enough bread to last seven months, but then they realized that the bread only lasted three weeks. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of that going on out there. There's a lot of fear out there. You know, Satan uses that. He's a deceptor. He uses that fear. Fear is not of God. Fear is not of God. You know, he gave us fear that, that we couldn't worship anymore, that they were going to shut down all the churches, that we couldn't come together. He gave us fear that we wouldn't be able to see our families or our friends or our loved ones. He gave us fear that we're, uh, we're going to be stuck like this for a long time. He gave us fear that even Easter wouldn't even happen this year. There's all kinds of fear that's put in there. What a deceiver he is. You know, Psalms 91 I've been praying that over my family and over this church, and over the people and the friends, everybody that I know, I've been praying Psalms 91 for them. If you don't know Psalms 91, I, I beg you to go to that and do that every day. Pray that over your family. It says in there that God will protect us from things. It says in there that he will protect us from the plague. It says that a thousand will fall on the left and 10,000 on the right, but he will protect us because he loves us. And we need to believe in the Word of God. You know, but Satan is a deceiver. He's a deceiver. See, Satan knows the Bible probably better than you out there do and probably better than I do. He knows the Bible. See, he tried to use Psalms 91 even on Jesus. See, he took Jesus whenever Jesus was in the desert. And he told Jesus, he said, you know, the word says, he was talking about Psalms 91, the word says that you could jump off this mountain and before you hit the ground, angels would grab you so that you wouldn't even gash your foot. Because that's what Psalms 91 says. Don't you believe that? But Jesus told him, it also says, do not tempt thy Lord thy God. You know, we've got to know the Scriptures so we know what is of God and what is not. James 1, 5 says that any man wants wisdom, all he has to do is ask for it. And if he asks for that, then it shall be given unto him. But if he has a double-minded man, then he can expect nothing. That's what James 1, 5 says. You know, I'm excited to be in this time. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be part of this because I see an awakening coming that, that this world has not seen before. We've got the chance for the church to stand up and get excited, to stand up and see how easy it is for them to take things away from us, how easy it would be for the government to say it's done. How easy it would be for that kind of world to fall into place and how grateful we should be to live in the country where we live in to where we can still come together. We want to thank our Lord, our God, for technology that allows us to communicate right now in these times. We want to thank God for allowing us to have our Easter service out here with a drive-up church where you can pull up in your vehicle and sit in the parking lot and assemble together. Because, you know, the Word of God, Hebrews 10.25. turns to Hebrews 10.25 in your Bible real quick. This was a regular church service. I'd say, whenever you got it, say, got my Bible. Got my Bible. It says in Hebrews 10.25, it says, Not given up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. 
You know, we're getting close to that day. I don't know when the time is. There's a lot of people who's made comments and prophets throughout the world and throughout time who have said that they knew when the end of the world was coming and what day it would be, and they knew what was going on because of times and the things that were happening, and every one of them had one thing in common. They were all wrong. Because even Jesus said that he didn't even know when the time or the hour would be. And he's the one who's coming. <laughs> so I, th I think that's important that we know that how we need to live day for today and not live the world for tomorrow and what's coming. That we should live it for today. And how she, we should believe in the word of God and how important it is that we stand there. You know, Hebrews 10, 25 says that we're supposed to gather together and assemble. And I think it's very important that we are. And I thank God for the technology that allows us to do that. But I can't wait for the day for next, next Sunday whenever we're standing out there and I see the cars pull up and people come up and we get together together to show the Lord how important he is in our life. I can't wait for that to happen. I'm so excited. But for right now, there's times whenever you should stay home. There's some times whenever you should stay in your house. I ask you, I was reading, I was looking for something to show me comfort and to show me peace of what's going on. And I turn to the Word whenever I do that because this isn't a magic eight ball that you shake and you open it up and you look and go, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do today. That's not what this is, but it is the Word of God and it's the living Word of God and it changes it changes for what's in your heart and what's going on with you. You can read a passage if you don't think it's the living word. Read Romans and start going through Romans and start marking down what stands out to you and what pertains to your life and how important it is and highlight that stuff. And then 30 days later, go back and read it again. You'll go, man, I don't know why I highlighted verse 7. I should have highlighted verse 8 because it is the living word of God. And you have the ability to ask. See, Jesus said that he gave us this helper. He gave us this helper called the Holy Spirit. Whenever you become a child of God, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, he will give it unto you. And it's someone that will abide with you. It will abide with you forever. It doesn't come and go like the wind. It lives inside of you. It lives inside of you. It's part of you. So if you... If you have the Holy Spirit, the reason he gives us the Holy Spirit is that we can turn to the Holy Spirit for guidance and that he will help us with the power to be able to understand the Word of God. If you have a hard time understanding the Word of God, maybe you need to start praying before you pick up the Word of God, that you start praying that the Holy Spirit helps you and shows you what he has for you today. He shows you the meaning of what is wrote down in the scripture that God has for you. See, I was, I was looking through the Bible and, and I, was, I was searching to find out something that I could make sense out of what was going on. And I turned to Isaiah 26.20. Isaiah 26, 20. See, there was another time in history. There was another time in history whenever God's people was having problems and should be locked up in their house to protect themselves. In Isaiah 26, 20, the word says, Come, my people, enter your chambers and shut your doors behind you. Hide yourself as it were, for a little moment until the indignation is past. You know, I think there's something to that. I don't think we should live in fear. I don't think that we should take and, and let fear creep in and destroy our lives to where we're afraid to even um, get out of the house. I don't think that uh, I don't think that we should put all and everything on God. That God 
uh, I need you to protect me through everything, and uh, I'm going to go on about my business and do everything that I'm supposed that I want to do. Um, and God, I'm just going to rely on you to do it. That's kind of like the guy who who didn't have a job, and he said, "Man." He said, God's going to take care of me. He always provides for me, so I'm going to sit right here in my living room until God brings me a job. That's not what the Word says. The Word says we're supposed to keep a hand to the plow. We're supposed to use Him for guidance, and we're supposed to rely on Him and not worry. But we also have to keep a hand to the plow and do our part. I think right now would be a good time. I don't think it's a time to take your whole family to Walmart and go run around through Walmart and let your kids run around and touch every toy in the store. I don't think that's what Walmart and all these stores are supposed to be doing. I don't think that what, that's what you're supposed to be doing. I think what you're supposed to be doing is going there and getting what you need and going back home. I really do. I don't think you should be fearful and afraid to get out, but I think you should take precautions. I think that's important that we do our part. You know, me and a good friend of mine had a debate the other day about this, about meeting in church and about things going on. And we had different views on it. And he, he was under the impression that we, should, that, that we shouldn't go to church at all, that we should stop all social gatherings of any type. And, 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 I, and I had a problem with that because I feel like church is as essential as Walmart I feel like church is as essential as Lowe's. I feel like that you're, there's a spiritual feeding and, and what we get by gathering together that I think is so important. But see, he felt other than that. And I'm not saying that he was wrong. I'm not saying that he's wrong, but it's kind of like the believing in the whole gun situation. If you don't believe that you should own a gun, then don't own one. But don't get on to me because I do. And it's the same thing. I feel like that personally in my heart that we can social gather just like we're going to do right out here in the parking lot in a way that we show God our obedience and we come together to where iron sharpens iron. But we can do it in a way that brings us together but not in danger. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited about what we're going to do. See, there was another time in the Bible that we're going to talk about today. And I think it's so important because we're so close to Easter. That, see, the Easter, we all know what that's about. We all know where the story is and what happened on Easter and why we celebrate Easter. But let's go back some 2,000 years before. See, there was another time. There was another time that pertains to the same thing, the same reason why we celebrate Easter. There was something else that happened in Exodus. Exodus 11, 12. Exodus 11 and 12. And we're going to look at that. So get your Bibles if you have them. Scourge through your house. Pick up your Bible. Grab it. And we're going to talk about this a little bit. I'm going to, I'm going to kind of set the scene. And there's, there's so much between what's happening in Exodus 11 and 12 that happened with Jesus on Easter that brought everything together. And there's, there's such, it's so ironic of how close that they're related in the things that happened between Exodus 11 and 12 and what happened in Matthew. And even today, even today, even as we speak, how ironic it is that these words pertain and touched my heart. They touched my heart and got me thinking how ironic it is that something that happened in Exodus and how me coming to this new church and being here for the first time as the pastor of this church on this time of the month of this time of the year falls in to what happened and the situation that's going on in the United States, what happened in Exodus 11 and 12. 
See, Exodus 11 and 12. See, God was talking to Moses. See, the Israelites were still under the rule of Pharaoh. And the plagues had all come. They had the frogs and the flies and, and everything that had happened and the water had turned to blood and all this. And every time God, it says that God would harden Pharaoh's heart. He would want them to leave and then they'd harden his heart so that he could do that for his glory. See, there's a lot of things out there in this world that is not of God, but everything can be used for the glory of God. See, in Exodus 11, God is talking to Moses, and he's telling Moses that he's going to send a plague. He's going to send a plague that into Egypt that's going to kill every firstborn man, woman, animals, living thing. Everything of the firstborn is going to be sent in a plague that's going to come, and it's going to kill everything, every firstborn. That's a plague now. You know, that's a little stronger than the coronavirus for sure. A little more exact, too. It's said that it's going to be such a plague that in 11.6, he says, Then there shall be a great cry throughout the land of Egypt, such as not like it has ever been before, nor shall ever be again, but against none of the children of Israel. None of the children of Israel. See, whenever we become sons and daughters of the Most High God, whenever we give our life to Christ, we become children of Israel. We become part of it. We're grafted into the family, adopted into the family of God, adopted into the royalty. Did you know that? Did you know your royalty? Whenever you give your life to Christ, whenever you become a new creation, your royalty, your sons and daughters of the Most High God. And he said in here that he was not going to, that it would not be against any of the children of Israel. See, he had a plan, and if you go into 12, it talks about this. And how ironic is this? Because we're going to start in chapter 12 on verse 2, and I'm going to read some. It says, This month shall be the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. See, now, here's the situation where a lot of people get messed up. But the problem is, with the way that we think, and what the Word says is this isn't talking about what we call our calendar year. This is talking about God's calendar year, which is what the Jews started right here on this day. And if you go back and if you study history, whenever you check into it, this month that shall be the beginning of the months is what we call April. How ironic is that? Here we are in April. And it says, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, every man shall take to himself a lamb according to the house of his father, and the lamb for a household and if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons, according to each man. Need You shall make every count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish and a male of the first year. See, what he was wanting is he was wanting to make sure that they counted up and found how many people in their household so they'd know how much food to provide. 
And he said, if you don't waste a whole lot, but if you, if you have a small amount of people in your family, then get with your neighbor. And I'm going to relate this to this day and time. I went into Walmart here a couple of weeks ago, and I was wanting eggs, and there's just me and Angela. There was just me and Angela in the house. All I wanted was a dozen eggs. I went in there and looked. There was not a dozen eggs. There wasn't anything. But I looked over, and there was a package of 60 eggs. <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's a lot of eggs for me and Angela to eat. We can have, let's see, we can have omelets, we can have boiled eggs, we can have fried eggs. And I felt like uh, Bubba on uh, <clears throat> with Forrest Gump there. Kind of felt like Bubba for a little bit, trying to think of all the ways that we could eat eggs. And I thought, man, I don't want to eat 60 eggs. I got a buddy of mine, I called him up, and he's got... I think five or six kids still living in the house with him, him and his wife and the five or six kids that they've got left. And I called him up and I said, man, how are you doing? He goes, good. I'm going to the store. He said, man, I can't find any eggs. I said, don't worry about it. I got 60. I said, he goes, you got 60. I said, man, I wasn't hoarding. I promise you. I just had the bite in the pack. It was a pack of 60. I had the bite. I said, come get the eggs. So we took about two dozen eggs and gave him the rest. That's what it's talking about here. What it's talking about is he wanted them to take the lamb, not waste a whole lot, but take the, take the lamb and make sure that they had enough to feed their family and to share with a neighbor if they needed to so that nothing went to waste or that unnecessary death was taking place for nothing. You know, If you read on, he talks about all the way through into verse 5. We're going to pick back up. He says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from sheep or from goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly in the congregation of Israel shall kill their lamb at twilight. See, I was, what a lot of us don't understand in the Bible is whenever you really study the Bible, you start finding out things that mean a lot more than just the words in the page. See, the Jewish people were really big in symbolism. It was really big about things that come into the words that they wrote that had more meaning than just the word. See, the reason that they were to kill the, the lamb at twilight, which was evening, which was evening time, which was at what we call dusk, where the sun was going down and it was just that hue, the glow from the sun, but it was about to be night, which means the end. See, it was the end. Twilight was the reason for the twilight was it was going to symbolize the end of them being held in slavery. It was going to be the end of a time period. And it says in 7, And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and over the lintel of the house where they're going to eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted in fire with unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs. See, there's a lot more to that than you could see. And, and a lot of times in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, you go back and you read about the unleavened bread, and it's the reason that they're pushing for the unleavened bread is, is even Jesus said, be aware of the yeast of the Pharisees. He 
He wasn't talking about the bread. He wasn't talking about the bread. Even some of the disciples were going, oh, Jesus is mad at us because we didn't get any bread for the trip. And he said, you fools, are you not listening to me? Have you not paid attention to me? I'm talking about the yeast of the Pharisees. And what he was talking about was the Pharisees and what they had permeated sin and law without love into their life. And see, but that's not what this unleavened is for. See, there's a reason for the unleavened and same as the bitter herbs. And we're going to talk about it the same as the roasted in the fire. It says, do not eat it raw, nor boiled at all with the water, but roasted in fire, its head and its leg and its entrails. You know, here's the reason for that. The roasted in fire and the unleavened bread was because if you boiled it, you had to take and go get the water and put it in a pot, and set it on the fire, and wait for the water to come to a boil. And for, this, for the reason for the unleavened bread is they would have to take the bread and put the yeast in and set it to the side and wait for the bread to rise. See, the whole reason for the roasted on the fire and the unleavened bread was for fast preparation. See, he knew time was coming fast, that the twilight, the end of a time was coming, and they were about to be released, and they didn't have time to get the water boiling, and they didn't have time to let the bread rise. They were to eat it in haste, and if you read down here a little further, you find that out. And it says to cook with the bitter herbs. See, the bitter herbs was a symbolization also. The bitter herbs was a symbolization, was a symbol of the hard and bitter times that they had endured. So they would remember that because their life was fixing to get a lot better because he was delivering them out of these hands. See, it says in 9, do not eat it raw nor boiled with water, but roast it over the fire its head and its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning. And what remains of it until morning, you shall burn in the fire. And thus you shall eat it with your belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, so that you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. See, he wanted them ready to roll. He didn't want them waiting around. See, used to culture back then was whenever you come in for the evening meal, you would unbuckle your belt from your robe. You would take your sandals off and sit down to relax for the end of the day. He's telling them, this is not a time to relax. Keep your belt on. You keep your sandals on your feet because you're fixing to get ready to move. Because we're going to be moving in the spirit towards another time and out of the situation we're in. He told them, he told them that this would happen and we're going to go into 13. We're in 12, 13. Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you and destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. See, that's why the blood was put on there. It was a sign for the plague to pass over that house. It was a sign for them to come to a, to get ready to leave, and it was a protection. How ironic is that, that the blood of that lamb protected them from the blood? 
from the plague. And the blood of Jesus is put over us to protect us from the sin and to let him pass over the judgment from us. You see, one day we're all going to be in judgment. One day that's going to happen. You see, Jesus is sitting beside his Father in heaven. And whenever you come up and your name is called out, see, Jesus is going to say, if you're a blood-bought child, he's going to say, Father, they're protected by the blood. They're protected by the blood. Let them go by. I thought that was so ironic that the blood over the door protected them from this plague and how the blood of Jesus protects us for eternity. I want to talk to you all a little bit about this. We're going to read a little further down on this. But you know, there was there were so many things that fell into place with the sacrificial lamb that they used. And Jesus, the sacrificial lamb. Even to the point to where they pulled him down off of the cross at twilight to make sure that there was nothing hanging on the cross. They broke the legs of the other people. But see, that's the other part. If you read in here in 1246 of Exodus, it says that they're lamb, that they're not even to break a bone. See, they didn't break a bone on Jesus either. If you start really looking and putting the, putting the things together of how significant these two things are and how close they are in relationship, it starts giving you a new light as to the meaning and maybe the prophecy of what was to come. See, if you read through the Bible, the Old Testament, there are 300 accounts in the Old Testament that talks about the prophecy of Jesus. See, Jesus was there from the start. Jesus was there in Genesis. Jesus was there at the very start whenever it said, and the word fell upon the earth. See, Jesus is the word. See, he was there from the beginning. God looked at him in there and said, let's make man in our own image. See, and he talks about the spirit, of how it fell on the earth, how important that is. See, Jesus was there from the very beginning, and he was set aside as a time as for this just like the lamb was set aside for a time then. I think it's important that we put those two together and that we use that. See, there was something here that talks about them being protected from this and how they should remember this. See, it was the Passover is why Jesus was in Jerusalem. See, and whenever he was in the garden, he was praying in preparation for what was to come. It brings a whole new light and meaning to why he kept waking up his disciples and saying, can you not pray with me? Can you not stay awake long enough to help me get prepared? Because see, he knew he was a sacrificial lamb and he knew he was fixing to be slaughtered and put on the cross. See, he knew that was coming, and he was preparing the sacrificial lamb for the time such as that. The same way that they were. As I read on through here, I started reading more, and we're going to start on 14 now, Exodus 12, 14. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast of the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by the everlasting ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. And on the first day 
you shall remove all the leaven from your house. For whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day, there shall be a holy convocation. And on the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation. No matter of the work shall be done on them, but that which every one must eat, that only may be prepared by you, so that you shall observe the feast of the unleavened bread. For on this same day, I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout generations in everlasting ordinance. And it talks about how over in 28, and it says, And it shall be when your children say to you, What do you mean by this service? That you can say, It is the Passover sacrifice of the Lord who passed over our house and our children in Israel. See, they had took a fast from yeast. And they did it for a long time. I'm not saying we're, we're held under the law of the Old Testament. I'm not saying that we should, that we have to uh, still do the Passover feast. I'm not saying that we still have to observe any of that. I think God released us from that with Jesus. But you know, there is a lot to be said for fasting and prayer. You know, we've come to a time right now in America that I think fasting and prayer would be a good thing. I'm going to ask y'all to do this. I'm planning on doing this. I'm going to ask y'all to take in accordance and, and, and possibly start praying every day, Psalms 91, over your family. And start praying for this Easter service to come and, and, and the Easter services in your towns and, and areas where you're at. Start praying that God will make a way for this to happen. That he'll give the enlightenment that we need to carry on and still do what we need to do to show our obedience to him. And I'm going to ask maybe on the 14th day, on the 14th day of April, which will be the 14th day of the first month that we possibly decide as a group. And you don't, I don't want you to tell anybody about it. Because see, whenever you fast, this, that's a personal thing with you and God. It's not something to go bragging about. But I think as a whole, if we decide to do that, I want you to pray on that and pray about it between now and then. Uh, we've got enough time that you can pray about what we're going to do at Easter and that you can pray about and study up and find out what it would be to get rid of all the yeast as a symbol in your household. And see if you think that you can go by that and pray and see if God puts that on your heart to do that. But what a time it would be if all of God's people set out on the 14th and decided that we were going to quit yeast in our diet for the seven days and fast and prayer. Because see, whenever you fast, in prayer. See, you're showing God that you're willing to sacrifice for Him. And you're doing it for obedience, not because it's law that you should, because, but your self-obedience to show Him that you can restrain, that He is that important to you. That you're giving up something of your luxury, something that is part of your life, that you're giving it up for Him to show him how much he means to you. Because I promise you, he made the greatest sacrifice when he gave up his son for us. I'm just going to put it on your heart. I'm going to ask you, if, if God, start praying about that. If God puts it on your heart, if, if God touches you to join us in this, don't tell anybody. I don't want to know. 
It's not my business to know. But I promise you, if you fast and pray, if you do that, I promise you, your walk with God is going to get closer because he honors the things that we do for him. He honors his love for us and our love that we show back to him. You know, we've got some other things going on. We've got a lot of things going on. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get ready for this as, uh, as we get bent up here to, to start to do the music. You know, <clears throat> something happened years ago right here in this church for me. As uh, we were having a fall roundup here been several years ago. Brother Andy was here and there was a there was a great group of people here. It was on a Saturday and the church was pretty full. And there was flu season going around. And uh, Brother Andy stepped up here right where I'm at right now and he said, how many of y'all out there has the flu shot? And about two or three people had raised their hand. And he said, you know, he said, I want every one of y'all that God puts it on their heart to come up here to the front and receive a flu shot. I looked at Angela and said, I ain't letting nobody shoot me with a shot. <laughs> I don't even like the doctor to do that. He said, we're going to do a spiritual flu shot. We're going to pray to God and we're going to have faith because our God can do all things. That there is nothing too small or nothing too big for him. And we're going to pray that he puts a spiritual immunization over us to keep us from getting the flu. This intrigued me that he had that much faith that he put it out on the line for everybody in the room to come down. And everybody in the room did come down. And see, the, the whole front was filled full of people right up here. And he prayed over us. And we prayed together that God would protect us from the flu. And it intrigued me to keep up with it. And a lot of the people here was musician friends of mine. And I kept up with Brother Andy for the people in the church. And to my knowledge... That year, not one person in this room got the flu. Not one person that was here got the flu. But see, I want y'all out there, I want y'all to come in agreement with us because it says we're two or more gather in his name. Whatever they ask in his name, it shall be done. See, we've got a lot of stuff going on out there. And I think it's really important that we come together as the body of Christ. That we come together and we pray for a COVID-19 spiritual immunization. I want us to pray for this. Lord, we just come to you right now. We want to thank you. You're the great I am. You're the most high the most honorable, we owe everything to you. There is nothing that you have or nothing that you have in store for us that you don't know about. Lord, you're so magnificent. You can do all things. Lord, we come to you now believing in your word of God, believing where it says we're two or more gather in your name. Lord, thank you for the technology that allows us to do this. Lord, we come to you now as one, asking in the name of Jesus that you put protection over us. We plead Psalms 91 over our family and our friends and our loved ones. We plead it over ourselves. Lord, we plead that this coronavirus cannot touch any of us that are listening, that are praying this right now that it can't touch us it won't have anything to do with us it can't come near us we're taking 
the blood of Christ and we're putting it over our doorways. And we're building a wall around us to put us in protection. We're asking in the name of Jesus that you protect us from the coronavirus. What a testimony we'll have that none of us that are listening today gets the coronavirus, that we can look back on this and we can say our Lord did that in the name of Jesus Christ because we asked him to. Not for our glory, but for his, that he can show how mighty and strong he is. And we love you, Lord. We ask this. And we plead this. And we thank you for the sacrifice that you gave that your son that gives us the right to ask this in Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. There is a river that flows from deep within. There is a fountain that frees the soul from sin. Come to these waters, there is a vast supply. There is a river that never shall run dry. There is a river that flows from God above. There That's filled with His great love. There is a river that flows from deep within. There is a fountain that frees the soul from sin. Come to this water, there is a vast supply. There That never shall run dry. There is a river that never shall run dry.